Hey everyone, it's Laura from the Teen Room, uh, and you are here for the Girls Who Code uh, Activist Toolkit Project Part 1. Um, this will be a five-part project um, that we'll be doing, um, and we're using the activity PDFs created by Girls Who Code, which is an organization um, that really is trying to funnel more girls into the coding, STEM, um, you know, software engineering programs like that. So. If you're here because you're interested in activism or because you're interested in creating websites, this is the place to be. Okay. I'm going to pull my camera up real quick. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I just wanted to kind of show you who you'll be working with for the next couple of weeks. Um, I won't typically be on the screen because there's a lot of stuff to show you. Um, but my name is Laura, um, and I am a pretty much complete beginner when it comes to coding. Um, so I played around a little bit with HTML and CSS with um, a little bit of classwork, but I've never built websites. So we'll be learning together. If you're a complete beginner, that's totally okay too, right? Um, and if you know a little bit more, then you should be able to do some even more awesome stuff when you're creating your website, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in now, close my camera down. All right, so. We're going to get started. Um, before we do that, I want to make sure that you guys have access to the activity PDFs because this entire presentation and all the examples that I'm going to show you is built around that project. So um, there's this down here. If you want to type that in, you can go and use that to get to our website, but I already have it pulled up. So this is the Bellwood Library Teen page. If you haven't checked it out, please do. We've got some new stuff coming on. Um, you would click here for the Girls Who Code. Right, and so we will be putting out each um, activity PDF for the, the video is out, so you can see it ahead of time if you want to kind of get familiar with the project. Um, but you would click here, and then um, it would pull it up in your browser. Now, I already have it pulled up here, so you would see something like this. Um, it's got a bunch of pages. Um, down at the bottom, it's got your planning worksheets, which you'll be using um, throughout right here. Um, and that's where you have space to write your ideas, do some brainstorming, things like that, okay? If you are not able to print it out, you can still download it right over here um, and use the PDF on your computer, read it through like Adobe or some kind of PDF reader um, to follow along and know what you need to be writing down for um, each step in the planning process. But if you can print it, I would go ahead and do that and then just write straight on those sheets, okay? I'm going to go back to our presentation here and we'll get started. So just to kind of highlight um, how this is going to go, there'll be five different videos that we'll put out and they'll be put out um, two weeks apart. So it'll be from September 2nd to October 28th. The next one will come out, I want to say it's September 16th. Um, and this kind of shows you what we'll be doing each week. So for the first two weeks, we're not going to be doing too much with the actual coding, the HTML and the CSS. We'll be doing research, planning our ideas, figuring out what we would want to go in a website, and then kind of drawing a mock-up of what that would actually look like, okay? All right, so I am going to follow along um, pretty closely with the PDFs. There is some stuff I will not read off of them, so you may want to have a look through so you get all of that. Um, this project, today in particular, um, they have suggested that it will be about 95 to 145 minutes, which is quite long. And the video will not be that long um, because I'm not going to, you know, sit with you while you do, say, a 20 minute research. But you can pause the video um, when we get to those points, spend the time that you need to do those steps in the process and then start back up. And I will show you examples, but they will not take the full time. So don't worry if that sounds scary. Okay. All right, so um, before we start jumping into kind of researching um, the cause that we would like to support, there is this Women in Tech Spotlight. Now, Girls Who Code does this with pretty much all of the um, projects and little weekly things that they create so that you can get an idea of what women are actually doing in the field and be inspired by them. Okay, so this is Kat Small. Um, she is a product designer, game maker, and developer who is currently working with Asana. She's also a co-founder of Brooklyn Gamery, a game development studio that focuses on the release and development of diversity-focused games and events. And you can follow along with this. I'm reading it from the PDF. 
um, there will be extra information, so you may want to read that too. Okay. Um, as she's continued creating and programming games throughout her life, um, Kat has also noticed a disparity between female players and developers. About 48% of game players are women, but only 22% of the game industry workforce are women, and only 33% of women in the gaming industry are developers. This means that only about 7% of developers in the game industry are women. So this inspired Kat to co-found Code Liberation, which is a site we'll look at a little bit later, um, a nonprofit organization that teaches women, non-binary, femme, and girl-identifying people to program. So not only does she teach women the skills needed to develop a game, but also shares with them the struggles and support needed to pursue their careers as developers. So we're going to watch um, this video clip here where she kind of talks about Code Liberation, um, and then we'll kind of reflect on that a little bit and then get started with our project. Now, the gender gap in the games industry is incredibly evident in the popular games that we see today. A lot of games rely on sexism, racism, and demeaning tropes in order to further the stories and utilize mechanics that we see in popular games. Now, this is really hurtful because seeing oneself represented in media makes oneself feel more validated and human. And women and people of color and other marginalized groups consume video games at an incredibly large rate. Seeing oneself represented negatively can cause painful things such as self-hatred, internalized racism, and sexism. The games industry is incredibly slow to change and sometimes reluctant in certain ways. And people who have spoken out about these subjects have been subject to harassment and threats. So instead of waiting for change, or pushing developers to change games that are currently being made, we decided that we wanted to help women and other marginalized groups be able to make their own games and tell their own stories. And that's why the Code Liberation Foundation came into existence. We are a for women, by women group that teaches women to program video games for free. And we're based in Brooklyn, New York, heavily supported by the NYU Polytechnic School of Engineering. Our first class was eight weeks long, and it taught about 60 women to program video games using C++. By the end of the class, everyone was able to make a game using open frameworks. Since then, we've kept going. People were so happy with what we were doing that we couldn't stop. <laughs> so we've taught over 190 hours worth of code to over 800 people. And we've taught over eight different game development tools, including Unity, Processing, Game Maker, and Phaser. In order to allow people to exercise those skills that they've learned, we run game jams or hackathons for games in which people can make games in about 48 hours. A lot of the people who show up to these game jams are actually people who came into our classes and got really excited about making games just like us. So what people do after these game jams is they show off their games and we invite people from the press to actually see them and give publicity to our attendees. And after the game jam, we encourage them to keep going, to keep making games. People have even said things like, it was so easy, it's so much easier than I ever thought it was. If you want to make a game, just do it. And we're so glad that we can inspire people like that. And many people who show up to our game jams actually continue on to attend games industry events, and some have even won awards and accolades for their work. We also host events such as game nights, and many of those events are actually co-ed so that our community can interact with the games industry at large. And Code Liberation co-founders and teachers have spoken at over 15 conferences, including AlterConf and IndieCade. And now this one, yay. <laughs> Code Liberation employs a special teach teaching method that's focused on reducing stereotype threat and fears associated with working with technology. Firstly, we teach that programming is creative, and we focus on employing immediate results. We want people to feel the joy of working with code and seeing something move on screen. To us, programming is a paintbrush. It's a means to an end that allows you to show something immediately working. We also try to be open and understanding and tell people how long it took for us to become good at programming. It did not happen overnight. It didn't even happen in like a year. It took a long time. And we want to be incredibly honest with people about that struggle. It's not easy, but if you keep working at it, you can do it. 
We also acknowledge when we make mistakes because we want people to understand that programming is hard and it's normal to make mistakes and it should be accepted and natural and okay to do that. We share resources and slides through an easy to use website and we also write blog posts and email blasts, Facebook posts and tweets so that we can give resources to anyone wherever they may live on the internet. So while we... All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get back out of that. And I do apologize if there's any background noise. I am videotaping this from home, so that may happen from time to time. Um, so before we move on, um, I want you guys to kind of do this little resilience exercise and think about um, the fact that even Kat, you know, who's had all of this time in the, um, you know, the industry has difficulty when developing a game. Acknowledge that, you know, mistakes happen, takes a long time to learn. Um, so just take a few minutes to pause and think about it. You can write it down if you want to. Um, how does it make you feel to hear about a professional's failures and challenges? All right. You can go ahead and pause now. Um, I am going to go ahead and continue with the process here. Okay. So we are going to jump into our first step. So before you get started with this project, um, you want to do a little bit of research. So you want to find out if you are creating um, a website for a cause that you support, you kind of want to look at what are other people doing? How are other websites that support causes doing the work that I want to do? And so we're going to spend some time looking at some websites. And I will show you a few, um, but you also should look at some on your own. Um, and if you go to your PDF, you'll see that there is a really big list that they've created there for you of different activist websites um, in different areas and different causes, topics, things like that. Um, if you're pulling it up from the, um, you know, in your web browser, like we've got it here, you can actually click those, and I will show you the page. You can click um, see right here. You can click on them, and they will actually take you to that page. We're going to take about five to ten minutes to look at these organizations who built their websites around their causes, and you want to take a look at a few key things. So is their message easy to understand? When you look at the website, do you know what they're trying to say? Did you learn something about the cause from this site? So obviously, if you didn't know anything about that cause before, did you walk away learning something new? If you didn't, it may not have been an effective website. Um, is there a clear path of action um, if you would like to join the cause? So if you are interested in supporting their cause, do they give you steps or um, ideas of how you can be involved? And then you want to look for any design or layout elements that you think are effective in communicating the organization's message. And that could be things like how high they place their message, how big of an image, or um, different things like that. So make note of those things that you like or that you are receptive to. And before you do that, I am actually going to show you a few websites. Um, and at least one of them is local to Chicago. Okay, so I've got some images here um, from that are just screen grabs from some of these websites. So we'll look at those first and then talk about the design criteria on the side. Okay, so this one here is the American Civil Liberties Union, which is listed on um, your PDF. Load. So they have um, added this pop-up at the top that comes up immediately when you open the page that is in addition to their other content, and that is asking for donations. So that's one way that they've chosen to get people involved. Okay, um, But this is kind of like their, their big front page, the first thing you see when you come in. And they have got, um, they've chosen to do very visceral imagery. So when you see those things, you know what they're talking about. This is the one that I did a screen grab of. Okay. So they give you their mission statement kind of right up front here. They give you some options of different topics that they support and causes they support that you can go to depending on your interest. So there's that one. Um, this website here is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. 
and they are actually, um, their cause is supporting uh, digital privacy for everyone. Okay, say the leading nonprofit defending digital privacy, free speech, and innovation. Okay, their layout is um, quite different actually from the ACLU. They do, um, it looks like updates, informational pieces, and that is their, their go-to. Um, you can join their newsletter. Get some more of their breakout uh, information down here. And then you can choose what you search out here. They have a specific drop down bar called Take Action that gives you options that you can do. Go back. This is the website for Code Liberation, Cat Small's um, organization. Okay. And right up front, they give you their, you know, their whole mission is right there. Got these drop downs here, we can learn more. Um, volunteer might be their version of kind of take action, the way you can get involved. They've also got their events, their mailing list. This one is a little bit more um, minimal than some of the, the other two websites we looked at, but that doesn't mean it has less information or less good stuff. And you can look around these websites on your own a little bit more. This one is for the Chicago Freedom School. Okay. And they tell you again in bold lettering with a big picture um, exactly what they're here for. Powering youth, honoring the past, building movements for change. Okay, and they give you a little bit smaller here. Rooted in the long legacy of liberatory education, Chicago Freedom School provides training and education for young people and adult allies to create a just world. So they are actually involved in um, getting more young people into activism um, and community change. So they rely on a lot of bold typography and imagery here. And if we look at the top, we've got this bar that shows you some of their youth programs, workshops, trainings about them, support us, ways that you can get involved. Um, right. Pull this here. So you're going to kind of do something a little bit similar. You're going to spend a little bit more time, as we've said, about five to ten minutes looking at some of the websites on the list or some of these here in more depth and um, it's kind of figuring out what you think was successful, what you might want to incorporate in your own website. And this uh, design criteria over here was actually pulled from the um, activity PDF. So just kind of pulling it out there so you get that right up front. Which website do you think was more successful? Um, are there any visuals, textual, interactive approaches that you would want on your website? Like if you could do anything you wanted and you knew exactly how to make it happen, what would you want there? What do you think would be effective um, in supporting a cause? And then you want to look at, are there any design elements that actually didn't work, that you didn't like and you thought were very ineffective in spreading the message? If you are going along now and just working along with the program right now is when you're going to want to pause um, and work on step one for that um, is on page 12 of your PDF activity worksheet. Um, and what you're going to do is just kind of take some notes on your design criteria that you like or dislike. Okay, so in step two, once you've taken the time to look at um, some different websites, they're going to identify a cause that you would like to support us that you want to create a website for. Um, and you can spend five to ten minutes, maybe it'll take you a little bit longer. You might want to, you might not have a cause in mind already, and you might need to search a little bit more. Um, and that list of activist websites is a good place to start. It gives you some ideas of what's already um, being done in the world of activist websites. But there may be something also that is a little bit closer to home. So you want to consider what causes impact you, impact your community. Um, you may also want to go very local and consider your city or your village or your block. Um, something that affects you. It could also be your school. So you'll want to brainstorm, and these are just some questions to think about. What challenges do you see in your community? We kind of talked about that one a little bit already. What world do you want to live in? 
So what is your vision for the future? What is your ideal existence? Um, and then think about what frustrates you. And what frustrates you could be something like lack of school lunch choices. Um, it could be food insecurity in your area. Um, and these are examples from the activity PDF. It could be something like the pink tax. That actually kind of segues into my cause that I'm going to look at as we do some of the different activities is actually inspired by this book here, Go With the Flow, by Lily Williams and Karen Schneeman. So this book is about a group of friends who are trying to navigate high school. They're in their sophomore year. And after a really embarrassing incident for a new student, they get fed up with the fact the school never bothers to fill the bathroom dispensers that hold pads and tampons. Um, and one of the girls is so fed up that she creates a blog about menstruation, period stigma, and sexism. Um, she gets her friend group involved in activism as well. So it's a great book that you can check out from the library as both a physical copy or as an ebook. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, but it's kind of what I'm going to use as the inspiration for my website plan and my cause. So you will see me kind of talk about some of those same topics when I'm showing you some of the examples. Hopefully um, you have paused and you've taken some time to think about your cause, brainstorm, um, and then you've gone ahead and written down um, your idea on your planning sheet. And that is also on page 12 of your activity PDF, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. So step three in this project is you're going to reflect on your cause. Um, and these images that are on the screen right now are ones that I took directly from the PDF. So it shows you the exact questions that it wants you to brainstorm about and gives you, it says, you know, take about 10 minutes for this, but each question actually gives you a time. So like the first one here, um, why do you care about your cause? So set a timer to three minutes. So you have the other questions, what do you know about your cause? Um, and what questions do you have about your cause? And I did go ahead and make some notes um, for my cause based on um, the book that we just talked about. So some things that I know about my cause already um, is that lack of hygiene products can actually keep girls from coming to school and it can contribute to education disparities because they're not getting as many hours in the classroom. Um, also, uh, for many girls and female identifying folks, um, you know, it's not a choice whether you menstruate or not. Um, so whether you have the money or not doesn't matter, it's going to happen to you. Um, and so that is, it can be a financial hardship for certain individuals. Okay. And when we think about it in the context of the story, you know, they're mad about their school not bothering to ever um, fill up the dispensers. An untucked dispenser helps no one. Um, I also put some time into thinking about, you know, what questions do you have about the cause? Um, so for me, um, what I wanted to think about is, are there schools that have put this into practice? You know, this is a, you know, a fictional story, but it's, it's a real world problem. So how has this problem been taken on in the real world? Um, what activism is already being done? So I'll, I'll, I'll want to do some more research for mine when we get to that stage about what is already taking place in the realm of my cause. Um, and I also considered, you know, what is the best way to achieve this change in schools? How are people going about making that happen? So you'll, you'll want to go ahead, um, pause the video here, and then follow the prompts on your planning sheet and go ahead and start reflecting on your cause, taking down some thoughts, and then we'll move on in a bit. All right, guys, moving on to our next step in the process. Step four is finding resources. So um, step four and step five kind of go hand in hand. You'll be doing research as well. This is, is really more identifying um, uh, websites or maybe even people that can give you the information you would need to build a website that supports a cause. So all the information you would need to tell to your audience, they will have. Um, so in this step, you're going to kind of start looking for um, websites that will tell you, you know, how to understand the core problems and challenges, the main facts you need to know, who's impacted, um, and some of the underlying structures and policies that affect your cause. And this will also be involved, like I said, in step five. Now, what can be really easy is to only look at sites. And 
that may be fine for you. That may be the way you go. But you can also consider reading books um, and interviewing a person who is involved in the cause and would be really knowledgeable about it. That is also a good way to get information. Um, for this stage, like we have up here, it says identify three to five resources. Um, we're also going to look at images. So we want to start taking note of some of the images that maybe we could use in our website. Okay, so this is where you'll start researching. Um, your websites might be a little bit different than mine. If you're choosing a cause that was listed on the PDF, then you can start from there, do a Google search um, to maybe find some causes that are connected and see what information you need to know. You will uh, end up writing these down on pages 14 and 15 of your planning worksheets. Okay, so it starts step four, find your resources. You'll want to list the resource. So the name of the book, the you know, URL for the website, the name of the person, if you're talking to someone, and kind of make some bullet points that describe why it would be helpful to you and to others. So why would you want to use that resource? Before you go ahead and pause and get started on that, I'm also gonna to talk to you a little bit about images. Um, so the PDF kit does give you some options um, in terms of finding some images that'll work for you. So Pixabay, Burst, and Unsplash are all websites that allow you to use their content for free. Um, in most cases, you just have to attribute the author. So this picture down here, like I said, um, you know, my cause, I went and wanted to find some pictures of some pads. All right, so I went to Pixabay. Let's see if the link comes up here. Okay, it does. So I went to Pixabay to find some images. Um, and when it comes up, it'll look like this. Like it says, stunning free images, royalty free stock. Um, you can do a search. It's also got some suggested images here that they just want to show you what they've got. Um, and I pulled, oh, wrong slide. So I pulled my images, um, this one here. And then I took a screen grab of some of the information it showed me on that. Let me see if I can access that image. There we go. All right, so this is the page for the image that I pulled and have shown to you. Um, and it shows you over here on the side, a Pixabay license basically says it is free for commercial use. So you can use it for, um, you are not doing a commercial use because you're not making money on your website, but um, it is, can be used for that. And there's no attribution required. It means you don't have to put the person's name or say where, you know, like who the image came from. However, um, they do encourage you to attribute your um, artist. So this is her information here, but I've also put it on the um, slides over here. Her name is Arena Alina from Pixabay. So you can put that next to it and then that just kind of, someone might be like, oh, I really like that image or I'm interested to see more from this artist and then they can find that person um, and that, you know, brings them more work. Um, when you're looking for images using some of these sites, what I found was I did the same search on every one using the same words and some places I got tons of pictures and some I got none. So what you'll want to do, and I'll move on to my next page here. Oh, we're not there yet. <laughs> okay, so what you'll wanna do when you're using those websites is kind of brainstorm first what kind of images you think would best illustrate your concept. And as you're doing your, um, you know, finding your resources, you'll see some images. And if you really like them, make a note. You might be able to use that exact image, but you may not. So you'll want to look for images that are similar. Okay. Um, you want to make a list of keywords that might be used to describe your cause or ideas. Um, because one person might say environmentalism, another might say climate change. You don't know exactly how it's going to be tagged. So you want to know some of those words that are related to each other so that you can do that. Unsplash here. Um, a nifty thing I thought that it did, and I pulled it up uh, here, is when you look into an image, you do an image search. So like I did with climate change, let's see. Oh, 
it gives you other kind of related tags across the top. So you might want to go environment, global warming, sustainability, depending on what your um, particular facet of the cause is. Um, and then I'll give you these images that are kind of related to that and you can go to the same, so environment. And it shows me some of the same. Um, these might be a little less useful to me if um, you know, what I wanted was kind of the, you know, protest image, no planet B, that might work. Uh, picture of trees might not. So you have to consider what images will work best to convey your message. And um, like I noted down here, if you can't find the right stock image and you don't have permission to reuse an image from one of your resources, you can always consider creating one of your own. If you can draw, you know, you might be able to draw an image that works just as well. Or you might have a flair for taking photos and you can do that as well. Kind of giving you a lot of information. So I'm gonna go back to the slide for step four, just so you can see these, you know, questions to think about when you're looking for resources again. Um, we didn't really talk about that, so we can do that now. Consider who created it and why they created it. You know, what was the agenda? What was their goal? Um, what is the perspective that they're speaking from? Is the information they're giving you valid? Um, and if you see a fact that seems very different from other facts you've seen, and so you'll look for multiple websites, and if one of them doesn't agree with the others, you might consider how big is the discrepancy? Does that mean that maybe they don't have the correct information? Maybe that resource is older and so that information is outdated. You want to make sure that your audience, when you create your website, is getting the most up-to-date, um, accurate information from you. So I'm going to go ahead, um, give you some time now, pause the video, um, and spend about 10 to 20 minutes finding resources and then listing them in your planning sheet. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the next step. Hopefully you guys found some, you know, good resources to work with because in step five, we'll be doing the actual bulk of the research. Okay, and this one is um, a little bit longer. You're going to spend 20 to 40 minutes on this. Um, so give yourself enough time to really look through and come through those websites um, and, and really think about these questions, um, which are all listed in your planning worksheet. So, um, this image I pulled straight from the PDF. Um, so what is your problem? What is the main problem your cause is addressing? Um, and you'll, you'll take some notes on that. Who does it affect? So who is affected by this problem? Which communities are affected by this problem? You want to think about your audience for when you're building your website. Who do you want it to reach? Who do you want it to speak to? Who do you think is most likely to come across your website? how do you impart information about your cause to those people? So what facts, knowledge, and perspectives do you want them to see when they come to your website? And that's where you kind of look at all of your resources and, and decide what, how you want to present it to your audience. Um, you want to think about solutions. So it's, it's not enough to identify a problem. We also want to think about what can be done to start rectifying that problem. Um, what changes are needed. So we'll, that kind of feeds into the action step here, which we'll talk about more in depth in one of the later steps. Um, but what actions could you ask your audience to take towards a solution? Like what, what do we want it to be? What is it? What do we want it to be? And how do we get there? Those are the things you're considering in this step. Go ahead and let you guys pause your video now, start doing some of that research. And if it takes you more than 20 to 40 minutes, that's okay. You can come back to this, this video at any time if you need to. All right, guys, you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about your cause, finding out all the information that you're going to need um, when we get into the stage of building our website. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to step six. And this is where we need to start thinking about focusing our message. Okay. Um, this activity should take you about 10 minutes once you get started. You're going to decide on your core message um, and your call to action. So there's some examples down at the bottom of this of core messages. Uh, the first two were taken directly from your activity PDF. So for the Sunrise Movement, 
Um, we're building an army of young people to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. One sentence, super simple, gets to the heart of what they want to do, their core message. Similar with the ACLU, which we looked at their website earlier, the ACLU's mission remains realizing the promise of the Bill of Rights for all and expanding the reach of its guarantees. Beyond one person, party, or side, the ACLU dares to create a more perfect union. So they're kind of telling you, this is what we will do for you and anyone else impacted by these issues. Um, the third one is one that I actually pulled from something that I've been looking into recently, um, you know, with voting being an issue of great importance right now and the presidential election coming up. Um, this is a statement from the National Coalition for the Homeless and their You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign. So it says, the You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign seeks to promote voting access for low income and homeless persons to ensure that people who are economically disadvantaged maintain an active role and voice in shaping their future. So they've laid out right there for you what it is they're trying to do with this campaign. Um, so you know going in exactly what they stand for. Um, that's the essence of creating your core message. So um, when you're thinking about it, and you'll be looking at that on page, let's see, page 20 of your planning worksheets, um, what is your main message? So you think about the one thing that you want people to take away from your website when they look at it and that's gonna be it. You want it to be, um, the ACLU here use two sentences, um, so you can maybe go more than one, but you wanna to stick to essentially one sentence that really gets at what you're doing. Before you get started, I'm also gonna to talk to you a little bit about call to action on this next slide here. All right, so um, I use this one to illustrate what you could do by using the cause that I looked into related to the book, um, Go With The Flow. Um, and so I found a few websites that deal with, like here, period equity, um, reducing stigma, things like that. And they're, they're addressing issues, um, particularly right now related to um, complications with COVID. So go ahead and look at some of those. Okay, so when I was looking at period, the menstrual movement, um, one of the first things I saw that's near the top is they had a button. Um, this is sign now emergency period supplies petition. Um, and this is a form of call to action. They're giving you right up front an action that they think you should take or that if you want to support their cause, you can take. Um, and I will go ahead and show you that here. Let's see if my link works. There we go. All right, so the period, uh, the menstrual movement in, in tandem with Alliance for Period Supplies, they are supporting, um, I did not go to straight to the website like I thought, but um, they're saying right now with the, the outbreak of COVID-19, um, because it's creating such a huge economic impact, it's also having an economic impact on those who are least likely to be able to afford period supplies. Um, and so they are petitioning Congress to create a grant basically that would help those individuals. Um, and it gives you kind of a breakdown of what they want. Um, and then a form that you can use um, or the form that it will show up as um, if you choose to sign the petition. So a petition is something that's really simple. It doesn't take a lot of um, risk or time and effort from someone. So that's if you have someone new to your cause, a petition could be a simple thing you can ask them to do to get involved. Okay. Um, because in this stage, uh, you have a place on your planning worksheet to create action steps. Um, I've gone ahead and, and shown like, so if I wanted to create a website, um, kind of educating people about the issues surrounding uh, period poverty and not having the money to purchase these resources um, and you know them not being provided as a public resource, um, I could go say, hey, go to period.org, which is the website, that is, you know, hosting the petition, um, click the button, and I will show you this one in a second, uh, you know, click their sign now emergency period supplies petition button, read and sign the petition to Congress, share with your friends. Those are four e really easy steps, tells them how to get there, 
what they need to do. So the reading and the signing of the petition, um, you probably don't want to sign something that you haven't read, uh, but um, it also gives them that extra step of share it with your friends. If you know all people who would also support this cause, tell them about it, get them involved, because the more people who are involved, the more that can be done, the more change that is likely to happen. Okay, so real quick, I am gonna show you that website just so you can see what I mean when I talk about the button they have up front. Okay, so this is their website. Um, this is another website that you could have looked at uh, if you, you know, were interested when you were looking for your cause. Um, and if we go down here, it tells you a little bit about them. Um, and then they specifically have call outs and action steps related to the COVID-19 health crisis. So they have, this is the one we talked about, sign now. <laughs> They've got a pop up. Um, so this is, uh, let's see. So it's a virtual fundraising gala. So that's the way uh, they've got this pop up here that is, you know, call out to say, hey, help us. Um, right now we're trying to look at these buttons. So you can sign the petition that we specifically talked about. Um, if we were more veterans of the cause, and this is something that the PDF talks about, if you if your cause is something that you're, you're expecting your audience to be people who are already involved, you can ask a little more of them. Um, and so this one here says, join the period fam, start a chapter. And so that's saying, start a local organization, which is a lot more time um, and investment and, and effort. So someone who's new to the cause might be like, oh, I'm not ready for that. So that's different stages of asking for input and, and action from your audience. Go ahead and close these out here. Go back to our slides. Okay, so that is um, just a really quick example that you could do, you know, if this were your cause, um, when you're thinking about action steps. I also found, um, when I was doing my research, this website called Period Equity, um, and I thought they had a really good illustration on their website, so I took the screen grab here of specific action steps um, that you can take if you want to participate in their tampon tax protest. So this is specifically, you buy your feminine hygiene products, um, you send in your receipt, so they will actually give you um, a kit, but you send in your receipt to Congress um, and say that this is unconstitutional, that I have to pay a tax on these products, they're, you know, a necessity for me as someone who has a period, so this, you know, it's unconstitutional. Um, there are a lot of states who are, as I've learned in my research, um, using that unconstitutionality to challenge many of these taxes, okay? Um, so I'm actually going to take you to this website so we can see a little better. Okay. All right, so it gives you an explanation of their protest, but what I really want you to look at is this, their action steps. Okay. So they lay it all out for the person who wants to get involved and then they, that person can decide, hey, I have the time, I have the resources to do these steps very simply, doesn't take a lot from me, I'm going to do them. All right. So we're going to go back to our slides. Um, I'm actually going to go back to the step six, focus your message so you can see that if you need to while you're paused, but go ahead and spend about 10 minutes focusing your core message and creating a call to action in those action steps. All right, everyone. You've done a lot of thinking and researching and planning today, um, but now it's time to shift into test mode. Um, so I like to write in my free time, and once you've got your first draft finished, the next step is to get some constructive feedback on what works and what might need a little more work from you. Um, and that's this step, okay? So we're gonna test our message and we're gonna get feedback. And what you want to do is consider uh, the three questions here. I pulled them from the activity PDF. Um, when you're thinking about this, you're gonna wanna decide who you wanna test with. And they suggest one to two people who are close to your target audience. So if we're thinking back to you know my book inspiration, if I am trying to create a cause to get more 
um, you know, hygiene products in the dispensers in my school, and I'm creating an activist website for it, my audience could be a lot of people in my community, but when I'm testing it, I may want to test it with another high school student. You may also consider a trusted adult, so a parent or, um, you know, someone involved in an extracurricular that you take part in, someone that you trust to give you feedback that is honest and useful. Okay. You want to consider what you're going to share. So um, for this stage, you want to share the stuff you came up with um, in step six in particular, but you can also share some of the other ideas that you worked on in the earlier steps. Um, so you want, definitely want to test your key message that you're going to use on your website, um, and you may want them to consider your action steps. Do they think that those are um, simple? Do they think that they're um, direct um, and gets you from point A to point B? Um, okay. And then when you're thinking about how you want to test those ideas, the format may be different for you. You might want to sit down with someone and have a conversation. Um, you might want to just show them your, all your planning worksheets that you've been filling out so they get the whole big picture. Um, or you may want to create a presentation like the one I've created here. Go ahead and create some slides or something like that to kind of show them what you're aiming for. We've got another slide for you guys that's going to give you a few um, tips on getting feedback. So again, we're, we're asking that question, what kind of feedback are you looking for? And Girls Who Code kind of has a framework that they use in all of their projects. Um, that gives you a few different ways that you can respond when you're critiquing someone else's work, but how you also want to guide um, the person who's going to be giving you feedback because they may not have been involved in a beta test before, so to speak. So they may not know exactly what you need to hear to make useful changes. Um, so you can find this in your activity PDF on page nine. Um, I'm just going to give you a really quick talk. Um, the concept of glow. Have them tell you what worked. What did they like? Um, what in the frame of what you're doing with this project is effective? Um, they can also consider things that will help you grow. So what could be better? What did they not like? And what do they think um, with a little more shine could really be something good? Um, you know, they can consider what questions they have for you. So after they've looked through it, do they understand what's going on? Um, what, what questions do they have? Um, do they need you to clarify your intent? Um, do you have some wording that maybe doesn't make sense to them? Um, things like that. They can also give you, you know, suggestions. Say, you know, what could help make this stronger? What do they think could help make it stronger? And, and are those, uh, you know, suggestions they've given you things that you can implement? Um, so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll go to the next slide. When, when you're doing some kind of feedback um, process, whether it's on your writing or your coding or you're testing any project, um, you may not use every bit of information that you get, um, but that the information that they gave you or the perspective suggestions may help you think of something else, a different way you could go. So um, when you're doing your testing agenda, you're going to first thing you're going to want to do is explain your project to the person who's testing it for you because uh, they have no idea what you're doing until you tell them. Um, and also, if they don't know what your goal is, they may not be able to give you feedback that helps you support that goal more strongly. Um, as we said, you definitely want to share your core message and your action items because those are definitely going to be part of the website. But um, you may want to show them some of your other planning stages so they can kind of give you feedback on that as well. Okay. You may have to tell them that you want feedback. So you may be showing them this and having a conversation about this project, but they may not know that you want them to give you suggestions. Um, so you may want to show them the PDF that has the framework with the glow and the grow and the question and the suggestion. So they, know how to respond because they may not have done this before. And then when they're done, when you've considered, you know, all of their information that they've given you, go ahead and thank them for their time because they didn't have to help you. Um, so it, just let them know that you appreciate that they, they helped you to make this project stronger. 
So I'm going to go back to this slide here so you know how long you want to spend on that. Um, you can go ahead and pause and test your message now. Um, it may not be possible for you to test your message at this time. You may need to set up, um, you know, maybe an email or a video chat with someone, um, and they may not be available till the weekend or two days from now. So go ahead and spend about 15 to 20 minutes right here planning um, how you're going to go about that testing phase when you're ready to do it. Um, and look at these questions, and I'll let you guys go ahead and pause right there. I'm going to go ahead and read the feedback fields section of your PDF because uh, I think it is important for this stage. But it says, in this part of the process, the goal of getting feedback is to help you make a decision. It is important to remember that this feedback is not a reflection of you. Learning how to receive and give feedback is tough, especially when it's feedback you might not want to hear. Try to remain impartial and don't get defensive if someone says something you don't like. Ask questions and listen to them. You might have an even better idea. All right, guys, hopefully you've had at least the time to consider how you'll go about testing your message, um, even if you haven't had a chance to meet with or, or call that person to, to do that test yet. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on to step eight, which is called analyze and iterate. In this stage, we're assuming you've got your, your feedback from your test stage, and what you want to do is look at that feedback and decide what is useful to you. Okay, so we've got these questions right here. You know, what feedback did you find useful? Um, what feedback was not useful? Um, you know, like what, what was interesting that they thought, but it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily help you make a change. Or, you know, you can consider um, what changes are you able to implement easily? So what can you do? What changes can you make? And there may be changes that they suggested that you really can't do. You may not have the time. It may require more skills than you currently have at this stage, um, and that's okay. You want to, you know, analyze your feedback, decide what changes you're going to make, and then go back and make those changes. Um, and in this stage, so according to this, you know, slide, you want to spend about ten minutes doing that, um, just deciding what you're going to do and then doing it. This is the last step in this week's video. Um, so once you've finished, you know, filling out all of your planning sheets, you've got your, your feedback, you've made some decisions and maybe made edits to those planning sheets, you want to hold on to them because we'll be using them again um, in the weeks to come. So we'll go back to your messaging and your action steps and your research when we're building your website, okay? Uh, now, I did want to share this. So Girls Who Code... Um, does encourage you to share your projects with them. They've been sharing shout outs and project pictures from other girls who code, uh, who code at home participants on their Instagram page. So if you want to go ahead and share your progress, you can do that by tagging them um, at girls who code or, or using the hashtag code from home. Okay. Um, I hope you guys are excited by this project and that you will come back with us uh, in two weeks for the next video where we will be doing our wireframe mockups, um, which is essentially we'll be drawing out uh, what we want the web page to look like before we start actually building it. Thanks for learning with me this week, guys, and I hope you'll be around next week.